guys, welcome back. Today I'm talking about Act 2 of Henry V, and we'll, it starts, as always, with the prologue. So the character of the chorus comes on and explains to us that we've skipped forward in time a couple of weeks. Henry V is all ready for war with France, he's got his ships, he's got his army, and the character of the chorus also gives us some really interesting gossip. The chorus says that some of Henry's nobles, his like best pal entourage people, have taken money from France to betray Henry V. They're going to assassinate him right before he gets on the ship to go to France. So the chorus does, doesn't just describe like what we should imagine in the background, it also gives us some really good details. And in this case, um, you could figure out... <laughs> um, if you just skip the prologue and you read Act 2, you could figure out that the nobles betrayed Henry. It's not like a major plot point. But knowing in advance gives us something called dramatic irony. That's when we, the audience, know something the characters don't know. So we know that Henry knows that they've betrayed him, but they don't know that Henry knows that they've betrayed him. And it's a tense scene, kind of like in Julius Caesar, right before Julius Caesar, spoiler alert, gets stabbed in the back by his best friend. It's it's a tense scene like that. And just knowing in advance what's coming makes it so much more interesting. So enjoy that. <laughs> okay guys, so act two, scene one. Shakespeare ramped up the dramatic tension with the chorus uh, telling us that juicy gossip about Henry V about to be assassinated. And then all of a sudden we switch gears and um, we're in a cheap tavern in a poor part of London called East Cheap. Anyway, so we meet Bardolph and Nim. They're two common soldiers and they're about to go off to war. This is the beginning of the subplot. We saw something like this in Much Ado About Nothing with that really terrible um, police officer, Dogsberry, who is really bad at his job, but he ends up in the end like solving the case and saving the day. This is the same kind of thing. We're gonna see Bardolph and Nim and the boy and Sir John Falstaff for a while doing their own thing, and then they're gonna interact about midway through the play with Henry V. This is a really great look at what it's like to go to war if you're not the King of England, if you're just a common dude. Also, it wraps up the story of Sir John Falstaff, which was mostly the last two plays. So anyway, there's Bardolph and there's Nim and they're talking about going to war. <laughs> there's also this guy named Ancient Pistol, I kid you not. And then a page of Sir John Falstaff, we call him the boy. Um, he's gonna be important in the play later on, but he never does get a name. We always just call him the boy. The boy, or a boy, who works for Sir John Falstaff, kind of like as an apprentice knight, comes in and says that Sir John Falstaff is very sick, he's dying, um, and everyone's really sad about that. They also imply that it's King Henry's fault Sir Falstaff is dying, and it kind of is and it kind of isn't. Again, it's really just wrapping up the last two plays. So read that and then skip to the good part where Henry confronts his assassins in the next scene. Hey guys, so now we get to the good part. Act 2, scene 3. Henry V is about to get on a ship and go to France, and his noblemen are getting ready to assassinate him. But Henry knows that they're going to try and kill him, and we know that they're going to try and kill him, but they don't know. So Henry calls these three noblemen forward. Their names are Cambridge, Scrope, and Gray, their last names that is. And he says, hey guys, I need some advice. Uh, there was an instant yesterday where a guy got really drunk and then he said some terrible things about me, King Henry. That's illegal, by the way. Um, and I don't know whether I should be merciful or if I should definitely have him executed. What do you guys think? Hmm. It's a test, of course. There's no dude. Uh, and the three noblemen are like, you know what? Even though he was drunk... Uh, don't drink. Don't do drugs. Stay in school, kids. Even though he was drunk... He's still responsible for his words and his actions, so you shouldn't show any mercy. You should definitely kill him. And then King Henry was like, hmm, that's interesting. I should definitely not show mercy, huh? Because I know that you three betrayed me. He has a piece of paper. He, like, it's very dramatic. Look at this piece of paper with evidence. You betrayed me. And they're all like, please, please, please have mercy. And Henry V gives this great speech where he's like, you literally just counseled me not to give this other guy mercy, and then you turn around and ask for mercy for yourselves. Like, that's not cool. And let me read it for you. It goes like this. 
The mercy that was quick in us but late, by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy, for your own reasons turn in your bosoms as dogs upon their masters, worrying you. See you, my princes and my noble peers, these English monsters. So let's break that down. First of all, he says, the mercy that was quick in us but late. Henry V is using the royal we here. When he says us, he means him. So the mercy that was quick, that means living. The mercy that was living in his poor king heart uh, 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 was suppressed and killed by their counsel. Um, he's like, you definitely said no mercy. But then that same reasoning you used, people are responsible for their words and actions, um, comes around like a dog to bite you in the butt. This is another simile, a very descriptive one, by the way, um, as dogs upon their masters. He's saying, if I use your own logic, it's going to turn against you like a dog turns against its master and bites him or, I don't know, destroys a throw pillow. Or whatever. So <laughs> then he says, look, everybody, look at this. Look at these English monsters. He makes it um, really clear that they're not just monsters, they're English monsters, because they're about to go off and fight a war with France, and the French are their enemy, but he wanted to make it clear that there were enemies among them too. <sighs> Super dramatic. So uh, then he has no mercy. He orders these three nobles to be beheaded in a super gruesome manner, and then he gets on his boat and he sets sail for France. <sighs> the man knows how to make an exit, let me tell you. Anyway, that's scene three. Okay, in the next scene, we switch back uh, to that tavern in East Cheap, and we see Ancient Pistol and Bardolph and Nim. Uh, they're getting ready to go to war. Pistol kisses his wife goodbye. The boy runs in. Remember, he doesn't have a name. Uh, the boy runs in, and he reports that Sir John Falstaff has died. They talk a little bit about um, the ravings. Like, Sir John Falstaff is delirious at the end, and he says all sorts of crazy things, and so they talk about that. It's funny, and it's sad, and it's weird, and then they're like, oh no, there's this boy, and he doesn't have anywhere to be. Uh, I guess we'll just take him to war with us, because that's a safe place for children, and they all go off to war. For the last scene um, in Act 2, we switch gears kind of a lot and see the court of Henry, no, of King Charles VI in France. King Charles VI is talking with his advisors. He's like, well, we're at war with England now. I hear King Henry is sailing this way. Uh, well, this is kind of a tricky situation. And the Dauphin, the crown prince, remember, the crown prince of France is like, no, he'll be super easy to beat. He's just a child. Uh, then a messenger comes in with a letter from Henry V, who has just landed on the shores of France. And Henry V writes this, <laughs> This letter where he's like, dear King Charles, uh, surrender immediately and give me like the crown of France and all of your gold and all of your personal property um, or I will hurt you like super bad. <laughs> so King Charles tells the messenger, just wait a day and let me think about it, then I'll make a reply. But of course, the King of France is not just going to give up without a fight. So that's how that ends. And then we're on to act three.